Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O Lord, we beseech thee, stir up thy power and come, and with great might succor us, that by the help of thy grace, that which is hindered by our sins may be hastened by thy merciful forgiveness. Words taken from the collect for today's fourth Sunday after Advent. And we heard from the gospel, the voice of one crying in the desert, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways plain. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. For our sermon today, let's begin by setting the stage. We're nearing the end of Advent. It's the darkest time of the year, in more ways than one. It is cold, the days are short, the nights are long. We all feel it in some way or other, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. There seems to be more attacks and temptations than normal, even extraordinary attacks, during this time. As every good Catholic knows, Advent is a penitential season to prepare us for the solemn feast of His Majesty's Nativity. It's an Old Testament in miniature for us to see what life is like without His Majesty's presence. Four weeks of Advent for 4,000 years, because the earth is young. Just as the chosen people of old, we know what is right We know what to do. We've been catechized. We desire to do it. That's why we're here. We want to be saints. But the power seems to be lacking. Just like the Old Testament. We cannot seem to do the good we desire or do it well and consistently. This is Advent. It is a revealer of faults and problems. It's a time to merit the Christmas graces we need. So keep fighting, dearly beloved. Don't give up. All of us are here because we want to climb up the mountain from the valley below, Jericho even, to be with Christ in his nativity. All of us here know something about the climb. Once again, we've been catechized. I hope you have been. If you're not, come to the School of Virtue. We know something about the climb and where the crib is located, but we feel powerless. Not surprisingly, our patience runs low, relationships are strained, maybe some are damaged, fights break out among the children over the things of no consequence, and maybe in some fights, not just between the children. How tempting it is to escape in some way or other. With all our Advent resolutions in ruins at our feet. In my years growing up, without fail, the darkest days were always this time, right before Christmas. Our family went through many trials, and it was almost always at this time of the year. Add on to this the uncertainty caused by the recent motu proprio, suppressing tradition. It's a real Advent, isn't it? A time when faults and problems and divisions are revealed on a global scale. What an Advent this one is. As for those on the stage, let's turn to the silent vision of Knock, Ireland. That happened in August of 1879. Present were Our Lady with her hands held up in prayer almost exactly as the priest prays at the Latin Mass. Also present, St. Joseph, St. John, the beloved disciple, near an altar of sacrifice with a lamb and angels hovering above. All in a downpour of rain. It took place outside the church building itself in the open air, reminiscent of the mass rocks of old, something Ireland knows all about 
in their efforts to preserve the ancient holy sacrifice of the Mass from all the changes the English were forcing on them. Amazing. Now, this fits well with Advent, as His Majesty is coming as the Lamb to take His place in the crib. Crib made of wood. Wood to prefigure the cross. To be first greeted by simple shepherds. This wooden crib and its surrounding cave is outside of Bethlehem and even as it were on the mountain. You have to climb up to it from Jericho. He's always being rejected, isn't he, in some way or other. All his life he was seemingly rejected until he's finally rejected on the cross outside of Jerusalem. Nevertheless, his coming revealed the faults of those in Bethlehem. They had no room in the end. He revealed the faults of Herod and all the leaders in Jerusalem and all Judea. They were informed of his coming by the three kings, and they did not make their way to the crib. Instead, Herod sought to kill him as a cause of division. Thus, we have the holy innocents. His majesty comes through Our Lady. In her holy virginal womb, this woman of all women encompassed the God-man, the Word incarnate. In her was all truth. In her was conceived the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, as we're told in the Apocalypse by St. John, chapter 13, verse 8. Remember, he's in the vision, fully dressed as a bishop with a mitre on. Thus, not surprisingly, she too, like her Lord, like her divine Son, will be a revealer of faults and division. We've talked about that before here. Another fully approved apparition captures this very well. Lords, like His Majesty, Our Lady of Lourdes came to a cave outside the town. In the novel, The Song of Bernadette, we find a telling scene wherein one good man is speaking to a scoffing worldly poet as he leaves the Lourdes, the town of Lourdes, to return to Paris. In saying goodbye to him, the poet said, You have the lady to thank for this, my friend. She has put me to flight. He he responded, Why the lady? I can't see what harm she's done to you. Harm, he responded, Seems to me that the lady is of a most tyrannical disposition. She demands that one take a decisive stand for or against her. Well said. There it is. The Blessed Mother has power to crush the head of the dragon and all the enemies of the church for all time. In the end, we cannot help but be for her or against her. And so she reveals the faults and divisions of those who come to her. And many problems were revealed at Lourdes to those coming before her niche with many healings to follow, even the deep wound of atheism. And thinking of all we're passing through at this time, to my knowledge, Lourdes, the grotto, the waters, the healing waters, has been shuttered only a couple of times. Some of these were due to floods, acts of nature. But only once, by man's willing it. This took place at the very beginning when the secular officials tried to erect a wall to block the grotto. But this changed with the Wuhan virus. When it struck, the local diocese, our own, not the secular officials, shut it down. Amazing. She's trying to tell us something, I think it seems to me. Think about it. This Wuhan virus strikes. Lockdowns happen. Even Lords itself. Who resists? Trads all across the world. Trads resist it. Before long... 
a questionnaire sent to all the bishops of the world about those trad parishes and trad chapels. And then we get a motu proprio from that questionnaire. Coincidence? Are there any coincidences in God's plan? Returning to the vision at Nock, if we take it literally, we find that at some point the ancient mass will be in the open air under a storm cloud. Along with the Lamb on the altar and Our Lady, this traditional Latin mass is also a powerful revealer of faults and divisions. And one recent erroneous thought is this. The ancient mass causes divisions or is a source of division. I've heard it many times. Now, how is it possible that such an ancient, and this, as far as I know, I'm not an expert in liturgical history, this is the most ancient form of the Mass across all the rites. How is it possible that such an ancient and long-standing saint maker A prayer that is supremely pleasing to God, always has been, is a source of division. This is an incorrect conclusion. It is an inversion. The truth is more realistic, isn't it? More sobering. This mass reveals divisions. That's what it does. It reveals divisions. Don't come here unless you want divisions revealed. And I propose that is exactly what is going on right now. And it's working. It's working very well. Even on a global scale. The immovable sacrifice of the altar of the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world is of a most tyrannical disposition. It demands that one take a decisive stand for it or against it. Anyone who has offered or attended the Latin Mass with goodwill, open open mind, and open heart knows that sooner or later there's going to be a fight, there's going to be opposition. And that opposition will be irrational. It will be emotional. Some recent examples. Just before the Wuhan virus struck, I was able to make a pilgrimage. I was blessed to make a pilgrimage to the various shrines of Europe. Fatima, Lourdes, my third time there. Loreto, Assisi, Rome, Manupolo. I tried to warn the pilgrimage company that there will be problems with my offering exclusively the Latin Mass. And it certainly was a trial each time. I had to sneak it in most of the time and pretend it was some other form of Mass. Sure enough, at two locations, those in charge broke out into yells, berated us, our tour guide was shrinking from the blows. I had to calm her down. It's okay. I knew this was going to happen. In one place, we were shunted off from the main church, even as the sacristans, very kind. Father, we'll make it possible for you to say Mass. Nope, you must be shunted off this little conference room that is plain as the day is long. And in St. Peter's Basilica, we were told there was a, we could say the Latin Mass at 5 p.m., and I knew you couldn't. You could only say it in the morning. And the sacristans were gracious. We'll try to fit you in, Father, but there's a Novus Ordo Latin Mass you can, can celebrate. I said, well, I want to say the Latin Mass the old way. They waited for the sacristan to come in. Both of these were priests. And he turned colors as he told me, you will not say Mass here. Once again, my poor tour guide is like, calm, easy. It was a precursor to what is happening now. 
I was given the grace to, uh, to remain calm and placid each time, even as we were denied the chance to offer Mass at St. Peter's Basilica itself. We had to go without Mass that day. Each time the reactions were inordinate. They were emotional. They had no foundation for their denial. They were nonsensical. It was a precursor to what is happening right now. The point here is this, that the Mass revealed a bias, a lack of patience, a lack of charity and unity. And this same division has been present in all my religious and priestly life, and I entered religious 30 years ago. Every time something comes up about the old Latin Mass, divisive speech and behavior appears. And the Mass is blamed And I'm always struck by one thing particularly. The disproportional dislike or blaming the Latin mass for everything is is never proportional. Meanwhile, over here in the Novus Ordo, there's all these abuses I've experienced personally, seen with my own eyes. Oh, that's too bad, yeah. It's the disproportion is amazing. Dearly beloved and lovers of the whole Latin Mass, we must understand that things had to come to this point. This is an extremely important point for today's sermon and for us to maintain our sanity. It had to come to this. It was inevitable. God is making divisions clear on every level. We're not only seeing many divisions in our family, our cities and states due to the coronavirus. It seems like God just took the fence and shook it. And now we have families that are divided looking at each other across this Wuhan fence. Are you going to wear a mask or not? Are you going to get vaxxed or not? And we're just fights going on in our families, our cities, our states our companies, and churches. But now it's deep inside the church herself. It's being revealed on a grand scale. I see the hand of God here. He says, this division has gone on long enough. But who's right? We cannot continue with such divisions present, we might argue. And I'm convinced that the main cause of this division is simply this. There are two different Christs. There is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, born of the Virgin Mary, the one we love and the one we bring down on our altar, the one we saw on the altar at Nock with adoring angels and saints. And then... There's the cosmic Christ of Teilhard de Chardin that's been taught in the seminaries ever since the 50s, basically. And maybe even earlier. This choice has caused a war to arise in philosophy and theology within the church, between the scholastics and the moderns, leading to two different Christologies, two different ecclesiologies, and two different liturgies. It's not about the Mass so much as what's underlying these things. And so, the one is marked by its perennial ancient usage. It is simple, it is straightforward, it is rational, it is unchanging. It's why dogma is always very welcome to the scholastic. He understands unchanging truth. The other is marked by progress and complexity. Cardinal Ratzinger, when he wrote the books, his books early in his priesthood and his bishopric, he even quoted Teilhard. He loves Teilhard. And he kept quoting this idea of complexification. That's a Teilhardian term. There's going to be a complexification. It is marked by emotional, charismatic, turbulent, and long, book-like, confusing documents to explain things. 
and circular reasoning. Thus, the division between immobility and its perfect expression in the traditional rituals and the progressive, always moving, never going back. It's over. Don't look back. No turning. That's the progressive. If we are indeed cast out of the churches, we're in good company, though, good people. As the vision of Nock puts on display, the Lamb is there. The Lady, St. Joseph and St. John and the angels. But in the meantime, let's be sure to learn the lessons from this historic moment. And I even have a reading assignment for you. Isaiah's chapter 40. That's from where the Isaiah's quotes came from today's gospel. And Luke chapter 3. Because after today's gospel, which is Luke chapter 3, beginning of it, he then says, you brood of vipers. He's not talking to the Pharisees. He's not talking to the Sadducees. He's talking to everybody. He says, what are you going to do to overcome this viper nature of yours? Do penance. Let's be sure to learn the lessons of this historic moment. Let's read these. Book of Isaiah chapter 40. He talks about immobility. And how all flesh is grass and all is going to pass. But there is immobility that God has placed in the world. There's a little conflict between what is moving and changing between and what is not. It's a very good chapter for us to read for today. And so it seems to me there are four general responses to the revealing of faults. We've covered these before. Let's cover them again. Let's learn our lessons from this moment. We can do one of four things, or maybe a couple of them. We can try to make things fit us. In other words, instead of changing ourselves, we can try to change things to be more in accord with our own disposition, to fit ourselves, our own fallen ideas. Herod, King Herod, personifies this reaction. In his anger, he sought to destroy anyone rising up against his plans, even the Lamb of God himself. This should sound familiar. It is the communistic revolutionary way. Number two, we can blame others for our own faults and divisions. This is an old one, first practiced by Adam and Eve. Thus, places like this parish are called all kinds of names, weird, rigid, overbearing, radical, cultish. And I'm not making these words up. These are used by others. Closed in on themselves, and so on. These folks are looking for scapegoats. Again, it should sound a bit familiar. St. Abba Dorotheus says that with all the saints, if some affliction befalls a humble man, he immediately blames himself for deserving it and will not reproach or blame another. No saint would ever blame, ever blame the Latin mass for divisions. That is absurd. It is almost blasphemous to say that. Number three, we can simply run away. Many down through time have done this. Many of them stealing various things from the church as they ran away to their self-made safe havens. The Orthodox stole all our sacraments. The Protestants stole a couple. Anyone taking the sacraments and using them without authority is stealing. They're robbers. Let's be sure not to join any of these groups. It's a dead end. This is not the way to do penance and merit the solution. And finally, number four, we can submit to the revealing of our faults as painful and as terrifying as it is to us. And then Our Lady will help us to heal. People flocked to St. John Vianney, the curie of ours, because they knew he would tell them what was wrong, as frightful as the prospects were. But they also knew it was the path to being truly cured of their diseases, of their ailments, of their divisions. The Israelites of old were told by the prophets to submit to exile as it was the path designated by God for their ultimate restoration. Those who did survived and they came back. And those who ran away failed. Let's brace for exile. It is the path to restoration or so it seems to me. Dear faithful soul, 
if this truly is the minor chastisement prophesied to come, then this is a dress rehearsal for the major chastisement. And I think this is the minor chastisement. All the prophecies are fitting and are being fulfilled. How long then does the divine revelation tell us the holy sacrifice will be publicly suppressed in that last age of the world? So terrible. That major chastisement. The answer, you should know it, about three and a half years. If this mass is indeed finally suppressed I propose to you it won't last longer than three and a half years. But we should be on the lookout for a major world leader who will rise up to be the last type of the Antichrist before the age of peace, the age of Mary, that is between the minor chastisement and the major. But he will not last and the mass will return. Have confidence. This will be the sign. The turning point is not far. I'm saying, what is the turning point? The suppression of the mass. That's a sign we're going to be getting real close to the turn in which everything's going to alter, and we're going to get one flock and one shepherd. And the third secret of Fatima puts this on display. At one point, some... And this is put on display in the third secret of Fatima. At one point, only some bishops... Priests and religious are allowed to climb the mountain to the wooden crib. But after turning, after the turning that I just mentioned, a holy father, a great holy father will come, lead up all in an orderly array to the top. Bishops, priests, religious, and lay folk of various ranks and orders. Before it was only bishops, priests, and religious, no lay folk allowed No Holy Father leading them. And they were walking up the mountain alone. In other words, it's suppressed. You get it? And it turns. All of a sudden, now the Pope and bishops and priests and religious and lay folk of various ranks and orders are climbing. It's back to normal. Then the divisions will be washed away with the blood of the martyrs being united with the blood of the Lamb. And the exile will end. And the storm will cease. And the immobility, the mass, and the faith will be restored to its rightful place. May we all be saved, souls together in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.